Anyway, folks, I want to welcome you, and I want to thank you for coming out and being being part of our service here on this uh, beautiful Sunday morning. There are all kinds of places that uh, we can be on a Sunday, even during COVID time. You know, that place might be home. But I really thank you that you uh, decided to come and uh, spend some time with, uh, with us here today. Today is Remembrance Day. Today is a day that every year we set aside to remember. There's all kinds of things on, in, in our life that, that call for our attention, whether it's our job, or our mortgage, or our families, or our church, or our volunteer time. All kinds of things call on our time and attention. But you know, Winston Churchill once said, those who forget their past are condemned to repeat it. And so every year, the world sets aside a time to stop and remember. Remember the horrors of war. Not because they are so glorious, but simply because of that. That they are horrors that touched every family, every generation. And if we forget those, we are condemned to repeat it. We remember the men and women who served, why they fought, what brought them to that time and place, so that perhaps our children and their children will not have to face those exact same things. We remember to pay homage to their sacrifice, and to give hope that that sacrifice has not been in vain, so that their legacy of peace can be passed on to another generation. Is it hard? Yes. Have we been brought to the brink of war in the past? Yes. But because of their sacrifice and because of days like Remembrance Day, many times we've been able to be pulled back from that brink and the legacy continues. have seen a great light. Those who dwell in the land of deep darkness, 
on them a light has shone. And in this sanctuary every week, the light of Christ shines. And it keeps burning. Because out there, there's some, someone going through a war. Maybe they're battling depression, sadness, grief, illness, loneliness, battling against temptation. And yet the light of Christ shines. So while our hearts are yearning, the light of Christ is burning. And we dream of home, a place where God is, a place that he beckons us back to, so that we know that when we're out in this world, we know that there is someone who is out there who loves us, who is calling to us, who is waiting for us. I've gone to prepare a place for you. In my Father's house there are many rooms, and indeed there is one there for you. The children who walked in darkness have seen a great light, and those who dwell in the land of deep darkness, on them a light has shone. And my friends, on this day, the light of Christ shines in our sanctuary. The light of Christ shines in our worlds, in our homes, in our churches, and in our hearts. And as that light of Christ begins to shine, so let the word of God echo forth for all to hear. Tell your children about it in the years to come. And let your children tell their children. Pass the story down from generation to generation. And then the people of God will say together, Amen. just known as the Great War at the time, known as the War to End All Wars, because the people thought that this was so grand, that was so great, that the weapons were so powerful, that the last loss of life was so horrific, that why would we ever do this again? And then, on November 1919, King George V presided over the first Remembrance Day to remember the horrors of war and to do the exact same thing that the light of Christ, that we said when the light of Christ shone. Tell your children about it in the years to come and let your children tell their children 
passed the story down from generation to generation. It was hoped that this war would be the war to end all wars. And sadly, it wasn't. There have been many more conflicts for us to remember. But still we seek to remember and to pass this story on to the next generation so that for them it would only be a story and not the reality. In France flow poppies flow between the crosses row on row. I don't that rock that place and in the sky the lark starts still really singing the fly. We lived, felt, felt dawn, saw sunset glow, loved and were loved, and now we lie in Flanders fields. Take up our quarrel with the fall. To you from failing hands we throw the torch, be yours to hold it high. If ye break faith with us who die, we shall not sleep. No, no, poppy's girl. Poppy's girl. Okay. In Flanders Field. They shall not grow old, as we that are left grow old. Age shall not weary them, nor the years condemn. At the going down of the sun, and in the morning, we will remember them. They were young, as we were young. They served, giving freely of themselves. To them we pledge, amidst wits of time, to carry their torch and never forget, we will remember them.
The good Lord has given us eyes to see, ears to hear, a mind to understand. He's given us this great world to live in. And he's given us a life and love to share. Let us come before that God now with the gifts that only we can give. Our offering will now be accepted. against nation, nor will they train for war anymore. Come, descendants of Jacob, let us walk in the light of the Lord.
on Sunday, June 28, 1914. Archduke Franz Ferdinand, heir to the Austro-Hungarian throne, was shot and killed by a Serbian nationalist during a visit to Sarajevo in Bosnia. Convinced that the Serbian government was involved in this plot, Austria-Hungary, supported by Germany, sent a harsh ultimatum to Serbia, and although Serbia met every demand, Austria-Hungary declared war anyway. Now Russia, the self-proclaimed protector of the Slav nations, mobilized his troops. Germany demanded promises of peace from Russia and France. And when there was no answer, declared war on Russia on August 1st and on France two days later. Now France looked to Britain for support. Although Britain was not bound by any formal treaty to join France in war, Sir Edward Grey, the Foreign Secretary, had made an informal agreement with the French. And then, on August 4th, the German army, on its way to France, invaded neutral Belgium. Britain sent an ultimatum demanding the withdrawal of German troops and reminding Germany of the Treaty of 1839, guaranteeing Belgium's neutrality, to which Prussia, the predecessor of Germany, was also a signatory. Unanswered, the ultimatum expired at midnight on August 4th, and Britain was at war. Now, Canada was not an independent nation at the time. It had to follow Britain's lead. When Sir Wilfrid Laurier addressed the nation, he proclaimed, It is our duty to let Great Britain know, and to let the friends and foes of Great Britain know, that there is in Canada but one mind and one heart, that all Canadians are behind the mother country. Prime Minister Robert Borden, calling for a supreme national effort, offered Canadian assistance to Great Britain. That offer was accepted, and Canada was at war. With a regular army of about 3,000 men and a fledgling navy, Canada was ill-prepared for a world conflict. Yet from Halifax to Vancouver, Thousands of young Canadians answered the nation's call. But within a few weeks, more than 32,000 men gathered at Valcartier Camp near Quebec City. And within two months, the first contingent, the Canadian Expeditionary Force, was on its way to England in the largest convoy to cross the Atlantic in all of history. In the beginning, there was a spirit of light-hearted optimism Exuberant enthusiasm, you know, it would be an exciting adventure, the boys would get to see the old country, it'd be good for business, and the boys would be home by Christmas. They did not know that four years of death and destruction lay ahead in a war the likes this world had never seen before. For the first time in the history, man's flesh, blood, and courage went up against them. The mass use of high explosive shells, rapid firing machine guns, poisonous gas, mighty dreadnoughts, stealthy submarines, and death from the skies through airplanes. Yet into this conflict, our young men went. They stood fast at Repri, stormed the Regina Trench, climbed the heights of Vimy Ridge, captured Passchendaele, and entered the Mons on November 11th, 1918. More than 650,000 men and women from Canada and Newfoundland served. Over 66,000 gave their lives. And more than 172,000 were wounded. And then on the 11th hour of the 11th day of the 11th month, an armistice was signed to end World War I. The horrendous casualties in military and civilian suffered on both sides spurred efforts to forever put an end to war. As such, King George V, in 1919, inaugurated and presided over the very first Remembrance Day in hopes that the First World War would be, in fact, the war to end all war. 
Unfortunately, that was not the case. Peace has been hard to maintain, with the world engaging in yet another larger world war and being brought to the brink of war other times. It seems that each generation has to learn that lesson for themselves. They learn the lessons of evil, of hatred, and violence on its own. But if every generation has to learn these, these lessons of evil and hatred and violence and war for itself, they also need to learn the consequences of it. It is for this very reason that we need to gather. That we need to gather and remember. We need to remember the past. We need to remember those who fought and died. It seems like something so small for what they gave and the sacrifices they made. But all we can ever do for our soldiers is remember them and remember what they did. And those memories are transported through our words of prayer, through our actions of, of coming together at Cenotas and remembering. And in the silence as we pause to remember. When we watch the ceremonies up in Parliament Hill, we see the soldiers. We see our veterans. And they are old. Perhaps broken with the weight of years. But when they answered the nation's call, they were young. Many were mere boys, too young, and they lied about their age so they could go and serve. And when they died, when they gave up their lives for their country and family, really they gave up two lives. The ones they were living and the ones they never got a chance to live. When they died, they gave up their chance to be husbands, fathers, grandfathers. They gave up the chance to, to grow old, to enjoy the freedoms that they helped protect and fight for. They gave up the chance to become revered old men. They gave up everything for our country. They gave up everything for us. And all we can do is give thanks and remember and there is someone always remembering them, someone always giving thanks. No matter what time of year it is, or what time of day, there's always someone coming to a cenotaph, to a military cemetery, to read the names, leave a flag, or just say a prayer. We need to remember those left behind by war. My friends, I recited some numbers. They're clear, they're plain, they're clean. They tell us how many died, how many lived, how many were wounded. But numbers do not tell the full story of war. For every soldier lost, There is a mother or father who had to bury a son or a daughter. Who remember laying their baby gently in their crib even as they watched their coffin being lowered gently into the ground. For every soldier lost, a family is broken. There's a wife who will have to go to bed alone. There is a son whose father will never again tuck him into bed or take him fishing. 
There is a daughter who will not have her father walk her down the aisle when she's married or engage in that very first dance. There will always be a Christmas stocking that will never be filled and a chair that is always empty at the Thanksgiving table. Even those who do come home don't always come home the same men or women who left. Many seriously wounded soldiers live the tragedy both in body and their spirit well beyond the end of that war. The war is over, but they have to keep fighting. War injuries will impact a family in every way possible. Medical treatments, medications, might be required for a lifetime. Their injury might impair their ability to find employment or even their ability to work. The healthy spouse might now be required to be a caregiver or breadwinner. It might leave our vet in chronic and constant pain for the rest of his or her life. And folks, those are just the people who are broken in body. More and more, we are seeing people broken in spirit. In Canada, it's estimated that up to 10% of war zone veterans, including war zone, uh, war service veterans and peacekeeping forces, and war service veterans are people like chaplains, or nurses, or doctors. They will go on to experience a chronic condition known as post-traumatic stress disorder. We used to call it shell shock. And while others may experience at least some of these symptoms associated with this condition, the most commonly associated problems with PTSD are those related to anxiety, depression, and alcohol and drug use. And these can be very disabling to the person suffering from them, as well as their families and their co-workers. Vets with PTSD, they lose interest or they lose interest or pleasure in activities that they once enjoyed. Life for them becomes flat and gray. Nothing brings color to their life anymore. Nothing seems fun or exciting or enjoyable anymore. These depressed states can be very intense, leading to total withdrawal from others and a state of numbness. Or it can be of lower intensity, just feeling down in the dumps. And these may last for little, little as, as a few hours, or they could last for months, even years. In more severe cases, the person may believe that life is no longer worth living. They answer their nation's call. And though they came home, they wish they didn't. PTSD can directly affect a veteran's family on a whole number of levels. A veteran with PTSD usually has a problem expressing emotions like love or enthusiasm. They can no longer hug their daughters or express joy in the birth of a grandson. And this may lead to family and friends feeling pushed away and rejected. And this in turn can leave the sufferer feeling isolated and unloved. And quite often this leads to to re reduce participation in family activities and hobbies. And it makes it very difficult to have normal family life, and it can leave the other spouse with the full burden of running the family. In some cases, a great deal of time is spent focusing on the veterans' problems at the expense of the partner's needs. And the veteran gets treated for his or her problems, but the rest of the family is ignored. The very people that he went to war to fight for 
are left unprotected and now have to fight for themselves. In an attempt to cope with unpleasant symptoms, many people turn to alcohol or drugs. Around 50% of males and 25% of females with chronic PTSD have major problems with alcohol and drugs, and the figures for veterans are even higher. Drug and alcohol abuse causes great difficulties in the areas of relationships, work, finances, and can cause violent behavior, especially to the people that they love the most. And over a period of time, these problems compound and they get worse. And what follows next is often separation and divorce. We throw a parade. The boys come marching home. We say victory in Europe, and they are left fighting every day for their families, for their health, for their sanity. But the war is over, and we go back to the way it was, but for them, it may never go back to the way it was. Jesus once said, Truly I tell you, whatever you did for one of the least of these, my brothers and sisters of mine, you did for me. When the war is over, we must remember those who bravely answered the call and served our nation. And then it is our turn to remember them and to serve them, to hear their call, even if that call is silent, and remember them and help them. That is our duty. And finally, we must remember why they fought. Because there are some things so valuable in this life, so valuable in this world, that they are worth fighting for. Our freedom, it's worth fighting for. Our values, they are worth fighting for. Our liberty is worth fighting for. Our children are worth fighting for. Their future is worth fighting for. My friends, freedom is never free. Oppressors of this world, big or small, seek to take it away. And so that freedom must come at a cost. And I think sometimes of, of General Matthew Ridgway, who on the night of D-Day tossed sleeplessly in his cot, and he talked to the Lord, and he listened to the promise of God that he made to Joshua. And that promise to Joshua was, I will not fail thee, nor will I forsake thee. In the midst of war, God didn't. I sometimes think of, of John Bernard Croke, a World War I veteran from Blaise Bay. He was a hero, but he was also killed in combat. Just a hometown boy who answered the nation's call. He could have stayed because the coal mines were an essential service. And yet he went overseas because he wanted to help in the way that he thought was best. He went to protect the way of life for his brothers and his family at home. We are veterans a debt that we cannot repay. And all we can do is remember them. Remember what they did. Remember those left behind by war. And remember why they had to be brave for all of us. All we can do is try to see that other brave men and women never have to hear that kind of call from their nation ever again. Today as never before, 
We must remember our veterans, their sacrifice, and the sacrifices of their families made and continue to make, so that we will work ever harder to maintain peace. Today as never before, we must pray for God's help to broaden and deepen the peace that we all now enjoy. We pray for freedom, justice, and security of person, where all men are created free and equal, and this world a more stable place to be. We must remember that no arsenal or weapon is as formidable as the will and the moral courage of free men and women. Let us also realize that peace is the greatest treasure that we can leave as a legacy. And Canada, as a nation, has negotiated for it. We have sacrificed for it. We have fought for it. But we have never surrendered for it. Let us not forget the sacrifices made by our brave men and women. And let us fight just as hard for peace so that our children and our grandchildren won't have to see war anymore. How can we do that? It's summed up in the word of the day that we all said together as the light of Christ began to shine. Tell your children about it in the years to come. And let your children tell their children. Pass the story down from generation to generation. And if we do, we will remember to which I can only say, thanks be to God. Somewhere between earth and heaven, the C-17 flies. Westward homeward Through clean, clear, safe blue sky At the back of the airplane Lying Time sorrow just begun Grieving, disbelieving His parents wait to welcome home their son And pray for the strength Somehow To face the days ahead While heading Nations bring him home, it's dead. When the rifles fire the volley at the word of command, when they fold the honored maple leaf and place it in your hand, you can cry then and say goodbye then. For nobody. Just a name on a cold marble stone And he's never, never, never coming home Somewhere between fear and hatred The black heart of war lies Back from the airfield at the 
their post in the combat zone. Buddies, comrades, wonder who'll be the next one going home. When the rifles fire the volley at the word of command, when they fold the honored maple leaf and place it in your hand, you can cry then and say goodbye then. For now, buddy's just a name. Lord, you are the Prince of Peace. And we pray that you will spill out your peace on our nation and on the souls of our military and their families. We lift them up. We lift up all the families. The families and the friends of our fallen men and women in uniform. We pray your peace will keep them and give them hope. Help them to remember the sacrifices of their loved ones with tears of pride and sorrow. Knowing their loved ones didn't die in vain, but secured our liberties for another generation. For each military member and their families, we pray protection and provision. Protection for soldiers in the field of service and here at home. We pray for the men and women who returned home broken, broken of body, broken of mind, broken of spirit, broken of soul. These are things that our doctors can't put together again. We pray for their healing. We pray that, that they can find peace. We pray for, for their families who support them, who are part of this healing, but who need support themselves. We pray for the families who, who have to cope with the loneliness, the worry of, of a father or a husband or a son not coming home, of a wife, a mother taken from her family. Freedom isn't free. It has cost a great deal. A cost that these men and women have paid. That we all have paid in one way or another. Lord, we ask your blessings upon them. And Lord, as we leave this place and go into the days of hell, there are so many things that call on our attention. But Lord, help us to remember. Help us to remember this hard past that we wish we could forget so that it won't be forgotten and that it won't be repeated. Lord, these are the prayers of your people. And on this day, O oh Lord, Hear our prayers. Amen. And now may the grace, the mercy, and the peace of God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit abide with each and every one of you this day and forevermore. Amen. And now could I ask you to stand...
Well, my friends, we pretty much come to the end of our time here together. And I want to thank you. I want to thank you for tuning in, making us part of your worship experience for this week. Now, folks, on November 11th, we remember some pretty dark times in our history. We remember war, violence, hatred, ethnic cleansing, destruction. We remember death. We remember man's own inhumanity to man. And we set aside November 11th so that we will always remember these dark times. We remember them and work hard not to repeat them. It's time of a somber reflection, of grief, of sadness. But you know what? We also set aside a time to remember something else too. You know, every Sunday, we set aside a time to remember that God so loved the world, that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believed in him should not perish, but have eternal life. That God did not send his son into this world to condemn this world, but to save this world, save this world through him. We set aside some time every Sunday morning to remember that evil and darkness and violence and death, they're strong, but they're not as powerful as the light of God's love. That the people who walked in the land of deep darkness, on them, on them a light has shone. And that we have a savior, a savior who is Christ the Lord. Now folks, every November 11th, we can go to a cenotaph and remember those who have fallen. But where can we go to remember the love of God? Well, one place is right here at Winslow United Church. Now folks, our church is open. You have just been through a service. And so, if you've never ever been to church before, or if you haven't been, for a long time, please, please consider this to be your personal invitation to come right here to Winslow United Church. Get to hear God's message. Get to hear about his love. Get to know his family. Get to know him. Now folks, I haven't forgotten that there's a pandemic out there. And so, if you feel like, well, it'd be better for you to stay home, then do so. But please, please continue to tune in and always remember that God loves you, and so do we. And so, my friends, until we meet again, and we shall meet again, stay safe, and may God bless you. Amen.